I'm John Kiever with MedPage Today at the ICAC meeting of 2010. There's been a lot of excitement over the past year over the possibility that a murine leukemia virus could be a cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. A paper published last October suggested that it was, finding that the, uh, the virus in something like 67% of, of patients who were examined. But a number of other teams that tried to re replicate those results could not do so. And I'm here with Dr. Myra McClure, who is one of, uh, one of the, uh, members of one of those teams that, that, uh, that looked into that, and she's from Imperial College London. Um, and Dr. McClure, uh, you, you were at a, a workshop in Bethesda last week where some of these issues were hashed out. Uh, you know, can, you, can you say anything now about uh, you know, why the assay method seemed to be coming to such different conclusions and how this is going to get sorted out? I can tell you how it's going to get sorted out, but let me answer your first question first, why you think we're all coming to different conclusions. I mean, there are only a number of factors that could be at play here. It could be that the patients are different, but uh, I wouldn't have thought you would have had such a huge differential between those that can't find the virus in any patients and those that can find it in 86 to 95 percent of patients. So I think that's unlikely to be the reason. If there were a patient difference, you might expect 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, but not, not nearly 90 percent. Then it could be the assays that we're all using, and uh, we're all using PCR of one kind or another. Um, but I, I, I've just given a lecture here at ICAC, and I've made a table comparing all these different uh, papers and all the different assays. And actually, there's not much between any of those uh, PCR assays. We all use uh, primer sets. We, most of us have repeated the same primer sets used in the original science paper. We all have sensitivities of the PCR around five copies. We all have the same input DNA. So I don't think the assays are so diverse that if the virus were there, we wouldn't have found it. Um, then there's the question of, uh, is, it, is there some uh, laboratory artifact? And of course, that's always an open question until... Uh, how are we going to reconcile this? I think uh, there's no point in having a league table of those that can find the virus and those that can't find this virus and see who wins out. I think the CDC and the FDA are, are going to take the lead here. Um, and there was certainly from the meeting in Bethesda a real willingness to get to the truth, to thrash it out. And everyone is, is keen to lend reagents, to be as cooperative as possible. Um, as you say, I was one of the first people not to find the virus, but uh, I was very, uh, I was pleased that Frank Roschetti, who, who can grow the virus, had come up to me and said, anything that you would like that would make it easy for you, you'd only have to call. Now that's, that's a nice cooperative approach to trying to resolve an issue which is important to, to a lot of us, to patients and to scientists. But I think this will be resolved. It's already started. There, there was a study with the BSRI who have got a panel of, uh, of uh, reagents that have been sent out to various labs. And that will happen. Uh, panels of, of positives and negatives and negatives which have been spiked with, PC, with uh, XMRV will be sent out to the laboratories involved and some of the reference laboratories. And we'll see whether or not it's the assays, whether it's the sensitivity of the assays or whether it's some other factor. Yeah, and, and one of those other factors could be just looking in the wrong place in the body. You know, you know, could most be. of these, uh, uh, all of the studies so far have been conducted in peripheral blood, correct? Could be. You know, would there any value in looking on the other side of the blood brain barrier at the CSS? or you know, peripheral nerve tissue or something else? I wouldn't say right at this point. Um, now, I know CFS patients are, are probably the most willing in the world to, to do whatever it takes to, find, to get to the truth of this, but I think that would be premature to ask them to give CFS fluid or to tap into their brains at this stage. I think we have to sort out our, our, own, uh, our own problem. I mean, why can't other people repeat this one finding? Now, it's certainly true that the only people who can uh, grow the virus in culture is the Whitmore Institute, is Frank Roschetti. So uh, it may well be that there's room for manoeuvre there that the rest of us should try and see whether or not we can grow it. However, having said that, let me say that the usual way of doing this in retrovirology is that uh, if you get a patient sample, you do a PCR to see if you can detect at least one copy of the genome. And if you can, that gives you um, encouragement to go ahead and isolate the virus. The fact that we're not finding anything by PCR would, to me, suggest that it's very, very unlikely that we'll be able to isolate. However, in the interest of science, I'm perfectly prepared to get some fresh tissue and to see if we can grow virus out. 
And you know, obviously, we've had a number of things over the years, not just with chronic fatigue, but you know, in cancers and you know, a variety of other conditions where viruses were suspected and you know, ultimately mm-hmm. ruled out as, as causes. So, you know, is, what, what's your gut feeling about whether this is going to turn out to be another rumor virus? Well, I don't know. All I can tell you that any retrovirology lab has got to be exceedingly careful. Um, as you say, most cell lines can be infected with a murine leukemia virus. And it's always a murine leukemia virus or contaminant, or most, most times it is, because in the 1970s, human cell lines and human tumours were often passaged through nude mice, immunodeficient mice, and they picked up the infection, the XMLV infection from the mouse, because most strains of mice are infected with this xenotropic murine leukemia viruses. So when the investigators took the cells back into the lab, then they isolated a retrovirus that they thought was a new human virus associated with whatever disease they were looking at. And, of course, it turned out to be, uh, to be the XMLV. And it was Robin Weiss who has uh, coined this phrase, RNA rumor viruses instead of RNA tumor viruses. And he himself has had a, an episode in his lab. I mean, you may remember, I'm not giving away any secrets here because he's published widely on this, that they published what they thought was the fifth human retrovirus, HRV5, from patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And exactly the same scenario, actually, as XMRV. There were none on the controls, but the rheumatoid patients all had the virus. And the difference in the, the genetic makeup of the virus in the patients was sufficiently different from each, in each patient to consider that it probably wasn't a laboratory contaminant. And in fact, it turned out to be a rabbit endogenous retrovirus. Mm. So this does happen a lot. And I think anybody involved in retrovirology who's, who's faced with a claim, a new claim of a retrovirus being associated with a disease has to keep that background in mind and has to judge all new claims with, uh, with uh, that background. You know. So I don't know whether it'll turn out to be like that or not, but I mean, the means are at our disposal to, to solve this and to find out, that, and we will eventually. Yeah, how soon do you think that's going to be? Well, I opened my big mouth this morning when I was asked this and said it would probably take a year, and I'm probably being hated by the American authorities for saying this. <laughs> but uh, it is already underway, and the study, the multicenter study that was described at the Washington meeting, they, they have it in four parts, four phases, and phase one has already been done. So I can't imagine that it will take many, many months. I mean, I would say a median time of about a year. Willingness is everything. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Professor McClure. Thank you. In Boston, I'm John Giever, MedPage Today at ICAC 2010.